Wrestling with the Past, hosted by Jason Nup. Join Jason as he reviews classic wrestling footage from the golden era of the WWF. When our biggest childhood fear was anyone from the dreaded Heenan family capturing the precious World Wrestling Federation gold from our red and yellow savior, Paul Hogan. There were rowdy pipers, snookas who superflied, animals with green tongues, Russian Volkovs, sheiks of iron, a demolition that could axe and smash things to bits. <laughs> it was a glorious time to be alive. It was a time to rock and wrestle. When a video coliseum fulfilled our childhood world with excitement and wonder. And now, the host of Wrestling with the Past. Give it up, give it up, give it up for Mr. Jason Nup. What's up, guys? Jason Nup, New Age Revolution down here in the cave for another episode of Wrestling with the Past. We continue on with uh, WWF television for the first week and a half or so in July. That's right. Today... Today we review January 7th through January 14th. I'm sorry. We reviewed July 7th through July 14th, 1984 of the World Wrestling Federation. As we have said, big things happening. The build-up to WrestleMania is happening, and we don't even know it. And they don't even know it, I don't think. I do not think that in July of 1984, WrestleMania was as much of a concept uh, as it would become maybe by the end of 84. Um, I, 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 I think. I, I mean, I don't, I don't assume that Vince had the idea of WrestleMania. Remember, I think WrestleMania was just going to be a really big house show. You know, it was just going to be another MSG house show, and they were going to slap a fancy title on it. I don't think by July 1984 they uh, had any idea that this thing was going to be called WrestleMania. But uh, the slow build is happening, and it's happening because of Moolah and Wendy Richter and Cindy Lauper and Captain Lou and Roddy Piper. Those five people basically uh, skyrocketed the WWF. You know, we're all like, well, Hulk Hogan. Yeah, sure, of course, Hulk Hogan is, you know, becoming an international name at this point. But Hulk Hogan didn't have anything to do with this rock and wrestling thing uh, yet. So, we'll get there. All right, July 7th, 1984, we have a championship wrestling episode. And uh, on that card, we have another Brian Blair versus Paul Orndorff match. And uh, this is like the third Brian Blair Paul Orndorff match that I've seen and this one is given away for free on Championship Wrestling uh which obviously limits the match um I've seen you know so so the next show that we do uh there's a Brian Blair versus Paul Orndorff Meadowlands house show match that goes about 18 minutes or so and it's fantastic you know those two guys for whatever reason uh, really, really worked well together, and and they're pals. You know, they were they were buddies. Uh, so the Brian Blair Paul Orndorff TV match, you know, gets about six minutes, and you know it's 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 your standard TV match, a little bit more back and forth. Uh, but of course, Paul Orndorff gets the Duke. Uh, also on this championship wrestling, we have a rare appearance by Andre the Giant, and he's actually in a decent match against uh, Samoan number three, uh, Samu, now, or Samula, as he was being called then. Now, what's interesting about this is, uh, as this is all going on, the Wild Samoans tag team, Afa and Sika, are starting to subtly turn good. And so, but Samula is, is staying a bad guy. Right, so they they've kind of cut Samu out of the Wild Samoans. They've pushed the Wild Samoans as faces, and they've left Samu to kind of fend for himself. and And he really just becomes a standalone character at this point. And uh, he, you know, is pretty much being handed over as a job guy now. 
And of course, Andre the Giant, you know, tosses him around the ring, and Samu does his job and makes Andre look like, you know, a beast, which which he is, I'm sure. And uh, I'm watching I'm watching the little guy here play. Uh, well, that TV's starting to get a little wiggly. I don't like that. I have to look at that. Um, also on Championship Wrestling, July seventh, nineteen eighty four, we have more footage of the build up between Mula and uh, Wendy Richter. This one we have Mula working out. She's in a gym. She's bench pressing at 62 years old with Captain Lou and his gross shirt open uh, yelling at her and, you know, you know, whatever. It's, uh, it's Captain Lou is gross. I don't, I don't like, I actually don't like Captain Lou. Um, I met him once at a convention and I guess I got to give him a little, a little pass because he was about a year away from dying. But uh, the convention was at a hotel. It was it was it was actually the Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame, and um, Captain Lou was one of the guests and decided not to come out of his room. You know, he would he just stayed in his room. I'm sure sick, not doing well. And then eventually he came down to the convention, and the photos with him are just miserable because he's just like you know he's sitting there, and he's and he's like not not with it and not having a good time. Uh, but I didn't like him. I, I, I didn't like Captain Lou. I think he was probably under the influence of the uh, of Grandpa's, you know, secret cough medicine for most of his work in the WWF. You've heard me talk about his matches, how he's the worst blader in the history of wrestling, just the worst seller. I, I, I really, I don't like him. Um, yeah, we've got a... Uh, this is Boston TV, so this 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 feed. Uh, however, I got my hands on it. I don't know through tape trading. Uh, it's it's Boston, so they so all of the in between match interviews, right, are are promoting Boston Garden shows, which are good because those are that's a high level house show. You know, that's one of their like big four or big five house shows. So they're promoting the Boston Gardens and. Uh, they're promoting a, you know, Jimmy Snuka. Now Jimmy Snuka and Roddy Piper are actually having matches around the house show circuit. So finally they got to their feud. Um, the boot camp matches are starting to fade out. And Roddy Piper versus Jimmy Snuka is becoming the new, the new feud, the new big match on the house shows. And so we get the, you know, we get the horrible interview with Jimmy Snuka. And what's bad about it this time is he's never looking at the camera. He is looking off to the side. So... You know, Mean Gene is standing here interviewing Snooka, and Snooka's looking over here instead of looking here. And Mean Gene does nothing about it. Usually it's like, you know, you get a little elbow, and or Mean Gene, mean Gene points to the camera and kind of brings him in, you know, and refocuses him. Nah, he, he leaves him alone this time. He lets him do his, he lets him do his thing. So Jimmy Snooka, in all of his incoherency, it's made even worse by the fact that he's not even looking at the camera. So he's, you know, oh, brother, TV land, and he's not even... Great. Love Snooka. Uh, next, so that's the end of the championship wrestling card. And then we have a Philadelphia Spectrum house show uh, from July 7th. So another great day for a kid. Uh, back then, 1984, July 7th, you got to watch wrestling in the daytime. And then if you stuck around for the Philly house show that night, you got your second dose. Um I don't like Philly house shows for a couple of different reasons. Uh, their announced team is is horrendous. Their announced team is so bad. And for many years, I, I would say like very early 80s up until current, where I am right now in 84, um, one half of the commentary team is a guy named Dick Graham. And I didn't look him up or anything. I don't know. I don't think he's a wrestling guy um, because he's he kind of comes across as you know, he's, he's in the dark a little bit. You know, he doesn't always know the names of the moves. Um, he calls Hulk Hogan the Hulker, and he's the only person that I've ever heard Hulk Hogan, you know, referred to as the Hulker. Not the Hulkster, the Hulker. And I don't like it. I don't know if he was trying to do his own little shtick, uh, but he, I don't like Dick Graham. And usually there's a Gorilla Monsoon with Dick Graham um, who balances it out. Sometimes there's a Cal Rudman with Dick Graham that makes me want to, you know, throw my t television in the swimming pool. 
Uh, this time around, we've got Mean Gene with Dick Graham. So Mean Gene and Dick Graham are our commentating team. And uh, let's see, we've got uh, we've got uh, Moon Dog Rex uh, re-debuting, right? So now we're starting to see the Moon Dogs come in. And so Moon Dog Rex is on the Philly House show. He's taken on Salvatore Bolomo. And uh, it's it's interesting because they they mentioned that Moon Dog Rex is a former tag team champion in the WWF. I don't know where they went, but they come back around this time, and then we get to see the, the, a lot of the Moon Dogs, and they become one of my favorite tag teams. Uh, the Moon Dogs, Moon Dog Spot, and Moon Dog Rex. So Rex takes on Salvatore Bolomo. They do mention, like I said, that Rex has been gone for a little while. And what do you know? Salvatore Bolomo gets the win, which makes no sense to me. Uh, I don't know if they were... I, they were never really pushing Bolomo at all. Uh, but, you know, if you're, if you're reintroducing the Moondogs as a heel tag team, you, you put Rex over Bolomo. But no, they, Salvatore Bolomo gets the win. And then hugs Mel Phillips, the ring announcer. Salvatore Bolomo always has the most goofy, over-the-top, childish celebrations when he wins. He jumps up and down in the ring like a 12-year-old. This time he runs and hugs the ring announcer, Mel Phillips. And uh, in my favorite moment, uh, Moondog Rex is still in the ring. After Bolomo is hugging Mel Phillips, Moondog Rex just walks over and punches Salvatore Bolomo right in the mouth. And, <laughs> and knocks him down. And then Rex leaves the ring. So, great. Bolomo gets the win. Rex just smacks him one at the end of the match. And, great. Um, what else we got? We got Pat Patterson uh, returning to the ring. Haven't seen Pat Patterson in a while. Uh, he's taking on Greg Valentine. Uh, and at this point, Pat Patterson is pretty much retired. And uh, I, think, I think doing commentary for... Uh, you know, the Canadian WWF shows, I think. Uh, but Pat Patterson back in the ring to take on Greg Valentine. Kind of a weird, weird match. No setup, no nothing, just Patterson's back. Uh, Valentine takes him, of course. We've got Hulk Hogan defending the world title against Paul Orndorff. And they always have good matches. I always enjoy the uh, Paul Orndorff-Hulk Hogan matches. Paul Orndorff looks very rough, as always. He looks stiff. And I think Hogan has even complained in the past about Paul Orndorff's um, elbows. Paul Orndorff would work the back of the neck with elbows a lot. And I think at one point Hogan was really getting schnockered by him and didn't like it. Um, Paul Orndorff is, is so angry during these matches, right? Or during this era, this particular period of time. He's so angry. And he stalls for pretty much the first 10-15 minutes of this match, reacting to the crowd doing the Paula chants, right? I mean, he is so furious about Paula. And now, according to the Philly crowd, um, they're, they're, they're working Paula, but that's starting to transition into the insult of Orndorff is gay. <laughs> so so now, they're, now we've got signs that says... Um, uh, there, uh, and, and I, and I haven't, I haven't heard this word in a while. Uh, femme, right? Femme. So there's a, there's a big sign that says Orndorff is a femme. Uh, so I guess, and then the, and then the crowd, you know, is doing the, you know, the, uh, you know, the universal hand symbol for gay, I guess, is, is, you know, your wrist like this. I, I remember doing this as a kid, you know, to, to tease people like an idiot. Uh, but they're doing the, oh, but, you know, Paul or and Orndorf is losing his mind. Uh, I do see the best sign in the world on this uh, card. Uh, we've got a Paul Orndork sign, which I, th I giggled at. I legit laughed at Paul Orndork. I thought was fantastic. Uh, the Orndorff is a femme is is just just throws you back to a time of you know. Anyway, uh, Mean Gene is fantastic at what he does as an interviewer. He's he's got it. 
He's got the look, he's got the voice, he's got the over-enunciation of words, he's got the used car salesman gimmick. As a commentator, I don't enjoy him much at all. And now he's lead commentator on this one. And what I've noticed, and you've noticed it too if you've watched this, Mean Gene has a go-to move when he's commentating. And it's just a, he just goes, he goes, oh, right? Oh, like that's his big, that's his big move. He, he lets out a large O when, when somebody smashes somebody real good. You get a big long O out of Mean Gene. I can't do it. I can't, I can't, I can't imitate it that well. But it's just an O. It's an O. Right, that's, that's Mean Gene's uh, go-to, you know, commentating shtick, I guess. I don't know. Then we get uh, more Samoans, and I'm really liking the Samoans at this point. They're, they're, they're I guess you'd call them tweeners, right? But, but leaning more towards good guys. I mean, the crowd loves them. The commentators are, are acknowledging that, so that's how you know it's really happening. The commentators are calling it out and saying the crowd is really behind the Samoans. The Samoans are high-fiving the crowd. You know that's a dead giveaway. They take on uh, Mr. Fuji and Tiger Chung Lee, and they identify the match as Battle of the Roughnecks, right? Because we got two bad guy tag teams, sort of. And, you know, you can't have that. It's got to have a special name for it. So it's Battle of the Roughnecks, Samoans versus uh, Tiger Chung Lee and Mr. Fuji. Now, you know that the Samoans are turning good because they're selling a lot. Right? They're getting in a lot. Uh, the, the team that they're facing is getting in a lot more offense than they ever did. Right? When the Samoans were bad guys, they dominate. Now that they're good guys, they're getting beat up a little bit because so, they got to come back and get the crowd behind it. So we're seeing a lot of offense from Fuji and Lee. And then, so the Samoans win, but then we have like the least cared about feud happening. We, get, we start seeing Mr. Fuji turning on Tiger Chung Lee. And it's not subtle at all, right? They're getting along. They're doing fine. Uh, Tiger Chung Lee loses, gets the pinfall. Mr. Fuji comes in just starts beating him up, right? There's no, there's no buildup. There's no interviews. You know, when they usually turn tag teams against each other, there's usually a, a, a few weeks of botches and you accidentally hit me and blah, blah, blah. None, none of that. None of that, because they didn't care. I mean, it's Fuji and Tiger Chung Lee. Mr. Fuji's practically done as a manager, or as a wrestler, full transition. To, he's actually managing at this point. Fuji is managing Morocco at this point, uh, but wrestling, uh, almost done. And then they just, for no reason, um, they just start turning Fuji against Lee. So, uh, you know, Mr. Fuji beats him up with a kendo stick after the match. Okay. Uh, so that's it for the Philly show. And then we've got kind of a lackluster uh, championship wrestling from July 14th, 1984. Uh, we've got, again, the good guy Samoans versus Goulet, uh, Rene Goulet and Lanny Keen. Lanny Keen, of course, goes on to be one of the cousins in the Hillbillies. Cousin Junior, Cousin Luke, can't remember. Um, but we see... So the Samoans on TV aren't necessarily good guys yet. At house shows, the crowd's erupting for them. On TV, it's almost like the crowd still doesn't know what to do. But they put the Samoans against a bad guy jobber team in Rene Goulet and Lanny Keene. Uh, so that kind of tells you where they're headed. Uh, Captain Lou is still like teasing that he's still the Samoans manager, so he comes out during this match, does a lap around the ring, and then leaves. I don't know. The announcers call it out a little bit, but and the Samoans are looking at him, you know, like, what are you doing? Um, we've got Ivan Putski, one of my least favorite wrestlers, Ivan Putski. Uh, he takes on, uh, for the first time, I haven't seen him so far, Gentleman Jerry Valiant, uh, the kayfabe brother of Johnny V, you know, luscious Johnny V, the Valiant Brothers, again, another 70s WWF Tag Team Champions. Uh, but we have Jerry Valiant. And, and one thing I've noticed 
about these guys back then. They're old. You know, they're super old, and they are just bowling alley, beer drinking, dart league looking fellas. You know, Jerry Valian comes in with his fat, you know, he's just fat, he's out of shape, you know, he's he's old, you know, and he's just, he's just in there, brr, you know. He's got like kind of the old man 50s hairstyle going on with the, with the quaff and the whatever, you know, with the pomade or the brill cream look, you know, he just, <laughs> and Ivan Putsky, Ivan Putsky's tan is concerning. I mean, Ivan Putsky looks a very, very strange color. Uh, I, I don't know how, he, I think it's like bodybuilder spray tan, I would assume back then. Because if he got that dark in the sun, Oh, like I like what's that skin feel like? That's got to be the most dried out chicken skin you've ever seen. Ivan Putsky's just strange. He's like four foot tall, and he's just overly strangely muscular, and he's got kind of that he's got that belly thing. It looks like he's got a hernia. He's got kind of a little bump, and I don't, I don't like Ivan Putsky. I don't like, and he does that weird headlock punch thrust into the head and. At the end of his matches, he's always grabbing the mic and screaming Polish power. Now, here's my problem with wrestling fans. I assume that in that particular audience, and this is what, what was this? This was like Hamburg, New York, maybe they were doing their TV tapings back then. Um, Hamburg or, or somewhere in Pennsylvania. Uh, Scranton, I think. Or no, it doesn't matter. They're doing these, they're, you know, whatever. I would assume that during this particular time, in Hamburg, New York, the crowd is probably made up of hmm, maybe maybe three percent Polish descent. Maybe, maybe they've got a guy in the crowd who's like, "Yeah, I'm I'm Polish." But when Putzky grabs the mic and screams, "Polish power!" the crowd erupts. They go nuts. Like, "Oh my God, we suddenly love Poland!" Right? Wrestling fans are just so easy. They're so easy. I even put Polish power, and then, ah, oh, I love Poland, is the crowd. <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, also on this very, like I said, lackluster card, we've got an interesting matchup. Uh, Dick Murdoch in singles action takes on uh, S.D. Jones, right? So a, a bit of a competitive uh, matchup. And, and you know, I, I don't know if this is true or not. And he's, he's no longer with us. Neither of them are, so I can't really say. But Dick Murdoch really comes across as, like, hardcore, possibly, a, like, like hardcore racist, right? That, that's, that's what I get. That's the vibe I get from Dick Murdoch, right? So, you know, what was, you know, was it a, I don't know. I don't know. I just get, I, I just get that vibe from Murdoch. He's taken on S.D. Jones, and uh, it's, it's a fine match. You know, it's a fine TV match. That's it. That's it. No Piper's Pit that week. You know, some Boston Garden interviews. Uh, a little bit more from Moolah and Cindy Lauper, or uh, Wendy Richter and Cindy Lauper, a little bit of training. And coming up, like in the next week or two, is the Madison Square Garden house show with Lauper and Moolah and Wendy Richter going at it. So that's it for the first week in uh, 84, July. 84. I'm currently watching, or I currently finished, a Meadowlands house show from July 17th, so we'll pick that up with the next episode. And then uh, we've got some TNT, we've got some championship wrestling, and maybe we've got that MSG Wendy Richter versus Mula house show. But uh, the Meadowlands show was very good. I've got a lot to say about that. We'll do that next. That's, uh, that's week one, July 1984, WWF, year in review. We'll see you soon. Good night now.